This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Ask ST at NLB podcast series brought to you by the National Library Board. In this COVID-19 pandemic, you can download the NLB mobile app to access your personal library anywhere, anytime. Now, due to COVID-19 safe distancing measures, the monthly talks by the Straits Times correspondents have been converted into a podcast series done remotely. For this episode, the Straits Times travel editor Lee Siu Hua has a guest who is the senior director for the APAC region at Skyscanner, a global online travel company. He is Mr. Paul Whiteway. They will discuss how traveling will change when it's safe to get on a plane again. Hi, Paul. Great to have you on our show. Hi, Suha. How are you? Great. So, you are thinking the love of travel is boundless, but travel is on Paul's mood during the pandemic. Paul and I will start our podcast by delving into the delicate dance of emergent recovery amid the huge setbacks in travel. We will also look at what travel will look like when it's safe to step out of Singapore again. Planes are now flying domestic and regional routes, right? Hotels are reopening and seeing occupancy rates of 40 to 50 percent or higher in markets like China and the US. There is pent up wanderlust showing up in surveys by TripAdvisor, Utrip, and Skyscanner. So the brighter signs are out there. Paul, I want to say that the recovery is picking up pace, even though the pandemic is still playing out. What do you think? So yes, we are starting to see some encouraging signs of recovery as travellers come to grips with the fact that we're living in this new normal. Just in terms of some of the data that we're seeing, March and April were extremely low. There was essentially no travel, pretty much as the entire global travel industry came to a standstill. 95% of all global flights were grounded. Demand in June is still much lower than it was this time last year, but we are seeing some increase as travel restrictions are starting to be lifted, but also as people are thinking about future trips. And in addition to this gradual increase in demand, we're also seeing some interesting changes in where people are searching to. And I know we'll talk about that a little later in terms of what destinations people are looking for. That's some good news you've conveyed, Paul, though I'm thinking there are still threats of regional lockdowns, right? So, for example, Australia shut down the border between two popular states, Victoria and New South Wales, to stop the resurgence of COVID-19. And that left 100,000 people on both sides of the border trying to cross it daily for work and school. It's disruption. COVID-19 is total disruption. And this is happening even as travel bubbles have been proposed. Yeah, the concept of travel bubbles or fast lines, as some people refer to them, are going to become more important moving forward. If the listeners are not aware of what that is, it's where some governments have proposed special travel arrangements for safe travel between specific geographies. So when the Trans-Tasman bubble was discussed in May, we saw a lot more interest in travel to Queenstown, Christchurch, Auckland and Wellington, which are cities in New Zealand, amongst our Australian travellers. Similarly, when Fastlane arrangement between Singapore and China was announced, we started to see more searches to Shanghai and Guangzhou in our data. So it's going to be really interesting to monitor these bilateral arrangements over the coming weeks and months, and it will impact the recovery of both international but also domestic travel, as you mentioned with the example in Australia. Now, in Singapore, these fast lanes obviously won't affect domestic travel, but that is one area that we expect to rebound much faster than international travel. In Singapore, we're seeing people search for two types of trips. One is, where can I go in the future, later this year or next year? And also, where can I go this weekend or this month? And those are staycations. I'm personally very excited that the government's put in place a plan to reopen hotels, and I think we'll see a lot more demand for staycation travel over the coming months. I know personally I'll be going to Sentosa at the first opportunity I can. Sentosa, there's a plan. And hotels are looking to people like you and me to support the recovery even as a pandemic continues. So it seems both of us think there is a slow recovery in travel and also pain for sure. And for many leisure travellers, if we have to serve quarantine on arrival at the destination and then another quarantine back in Singapore, that's a deal breaker. 
Are we too optimistic when we say green shoots are sprouting in the travel industry, Paul? So the phrase that I think best summarizes what we'll see over the coming months and possibly years is this concept of the delicate dance. I'm originally from Victoria in Australia, and a lot of my family are still there. Melbourne was opened up a few weeks ago, but they recently saw a spike in cases. And then last week, they had to lock down the city again for six weeks. Similarly, Tokyo recently saw a spike in cases. And then the the Tokyo governor just last week and um, asked residents to avoid unnecessary or urgent travel. So until we have effective treatments and or a vaccine, travel is going to require this delicate dance that balances a number of of items. And I, I think for now, more people are looking to rediscover travel and the beauty of the world you know, in their own backyard. I'm super happy that Singapore Zoo's once again open, for example. I'll be taking my little boy Cohen there for his first birthday next month. And at the same time, thinking about future trips that I'll be taking. So definitely optimistic, but it's going to be a long road ahead. Oh, happy birthday in advance to your little Thank boy. You. <laughs> Zoos are kind of like a different country, to me at least, with their sights, sounds and sensations. So while we wait out the pandemic in Singapore, we are seeing a surge of solutions with technology. Airports like Singapore's T3 will be almost purely contactless, right, from check-in to boarding. So entire industries are being rebooted. The beloved never-ending buffet line will start to become a memory in hotels and cruise ships where they can be a highlight. Although, some hotels and cruise ships may switch to semi-buffets with gloved and masked staff. Paul, let's discuss a couple of ways the experience will change of the traveller. Sure. So, let's break that down in terms of sort of the planning and then the travelling phase. So, we recently conducted a global survey amongst our users, including travellers from Singapore, and we asked them what's important for them when they think about accommodation. Now, historically, the most critical factors would have been things like price and location. But in a post-COVID world, hygiene and safety have taken over the top spot in those list of priorities. It's really encouraging to see hotel groups that are stepping up their practices and communicating their various protocols to travellers. And in Skyscanner, for example, we display a cleanliness rating for most of the properties that are offered on our site as well. We know from that same survey that about half of Singapore travellers also consider flexible room changes and cancellation policies to be extremely important. Again, back to that delicate dance point. So can I make changes to my travel plans? So overall on the accommodation side, we're seeing things like hotel star ratings, reward and loyalty points becoming less important. So that's on the planning side. When we think about when it comes to the actual travelling part of the trip, we're going to see a lot of changes here as well. If you think about airports and airplanes, they were really not designed with social distancing in mind. So overall, we'll see a lot of attention and focus here to make people feel comfortable that when they fly, it's safe. You probably saw Singapore Airlines recently introduced its promise of care um, and they outlined their enhanced safety measures that included things like cleaning the aircraft, ensuring the personal hygiene of the crew and providing a care kit, which comprises of a face mask and sanitizers. So these are the kinds of measures that are going to provide that reassurance to travellers so that they know the airline is committed to their safety from the time they check in all the way through to landing. And we'll also see changes there, actually, once you arrive at your destination. So nearly half of our travellers, so 46%, say that they will avoid common areas such as the gym and the swimming pool. As you mentioned, in terms of the restaurant buffet is an example of that. And two in five, 40%, will likely opt for outdoor dining. So yes, lots of changes, but at the same time, I think it presents the industry with a lot of opportunities to innovate. And you know, this is an incredibly innovative industry that responds to that traveler demand. So Paul, what are some of the new services that hotels will offer? I'd be really personally interested to see what services are offered. So back to the example of Sentosa, they might offer in-room dining for my wife, for example, but they could actually come up with really cool things as well. It might be a birthday cake or games that I can play with my boy. So I think in general, this change in the industry is going to spark a lot of innovation. Another example of innovation, you saw Singapore Airlines suspended the Chris Shop, which is its in-flight shopping service, and they began to promote that with home delivery. So I think in general, we'll see a lot more innovation in this industry and the services that hotels offer will be one of those areas. More broadly, I think COVID is acting as an accelerant for many technologies that we're already seeing. 
So, for example, the rise in online e-commerce, which everyone's aware of, the way people are communicating with each other electronically, an increasing proliferation of mobile and contactless payments. So these technology trends and others, such as biometrics, you know, all of this combined with the inventiveness of the industry you know, will form part of that new normal. That's a good survey of the landscape. And I've always felt that the travel industry, travel players are inventive, like you say, resilient, coming up with ideas. So to our next point, it's something on the minds of listeners, discounts, and whether travel will become a luxury in a global recession. But wouldn't the higher cost of keeping travellers safe have to be passed at some point or ultimately to travellers? Paul? Yeah, see, well, you're absolutely right. Pricing is always on the top of mind for travellers. And in the short term, we're likely to see travel providers focus on stimulating demand. So we'll see discounts of hotels and airfares will be quite common. Longer term, though, we do expect to see a shift towards more value-based pricing. So where aspects such as flexibility, safety and trust will be built into the prices. And this is both from the perspective of what the suppliers need to charge, but also what people are looking for. So when I go to Sentosa, for example, I would previously have looked for a breakfast buffet offer, and I very much used to enjoy that. But now I might actually look for an offer that includes breakfast in the room delivery. As I plan my trip back to Australia, I might save up all of my miles and look for an upgrade on premium economy. We do know that trust and peace of mind will be critically important for them. But to be honest, it really is too soon to know exactly how prices will change moving forward. Now, if you like the Ask ST at NLB podcast, please subscribe to The Straits Times for free on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or Spotify. Give us a rating too. This series is brought to you by the National Library Board. In this COVID-19 pandemic, You can download the NLB mobile app to access your personal library anywhere, anytime. And now, back to our episode with ST's travel editor Lee Siu Hua and Paul Whiteway, the Senior Director for the APAC region at global online travel company Skyscanner. Travellers are going to place a premium on two things, space and safety, when we venture out again. So I'm thinking, you know, when we can travel again, where to, where to next and why? And I'm thinking that some possibilities for the next trip, we're already seeing the rise of road trips in China, the US, Australia, it's going to happen around us in Malaysia too, right? And short haul trips in the region will also appeal. And we really have all kinds of gems around us tropical highlands, islands in Malaysia, Vietnam, and all around us. And outdoor sea trips are going to be a thing to like nature, beaches and islands. They will be attractive because people are looking for fresh air escapes. And I'm also thinking that their destinations like Mongolia or Georgia, all beautiful hotels tucked far away in secluded places. So late last year, Paul, if you remember, I spoke with you about Skyscanner's APEC report on the travel trends of 2020. That was late last year, already seems a long time ago. And I remember that slow travel was a top trend with almost 20% of Singaporeans wanting to travel slower. This can include traveling slow in cities or in nature. I imagine slow travel will pick up again after the pandemic when the mood is going to be cautious or contemplative and slow. Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything that you said. And when we last met, I think it was in December of last year, we spoke about some of the travel trends that we were seeing in a pre-COVID world, in particular, the rise of this slow travel movement and JOMO, which was a new term that I'd learned at the time, which was the joy of missing out. And those basically mean people going to more remote, quiet, secluded places where the pace is a lot slower. And as we think about what's happening later in this year and moving into next year, I think what we anticipate that we'll see is a continuation of this trend. People getting back to nature more, going for the more the serene-like experience, as you mentioned. Last month, Quinh Nho, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, which is a small coastal city in Vietnam, that entered the top 10 list of destinations amongst our Vietnamese travellers. That was up from 25 this time last year. 
in the Philippines, we're seeing what was formerly a surfing hotspot, um, Chagao Island, um, climbing the ranks and becoming more popular even among sort of mainstream travelers. And we're also going to see an increase in the popularity of eco-friendly travel. So people will consider potentially, how do I support a community that's been particularly hit by the decline in tourism? The Japan government, you might have seen, as well as the Taiwan government, announced incentives that will go direct to travelers to stimulate the demand. So I think in the nearer term, Singaporean travelers uh, will look for how that they can have these experiences closer to home. Again, back to the staycations um, point before. It'll be really interesting to see if what increase we see in road trips to Malaysia. There's talk of, and I think there's some recent announcements on opening up the borders between Singapore and Malaysia under certain conditions. So I think that road trips to Malaysia will be an interesting one to follow as well. Yeah, road trips will be so cool, Paul. And I'm curious, personally, Paul, where will you go to next? Uh, so for me, that, that same survey that I talked about, a lot of our travellers said that the first trip they'll take will be to visit family and friends. I'm no different. I'd definitely like to take Cohen, who's my son and my wife, back to Australia to visit my extended family. My grandmother is uh, 91 years old now, so it'd be really nice to take him back to see her again. And then from there, we talked about going to New Zealand, possibly on a road trip, renting a camper van, or to a place called Rottnest Island, which is just off Perth. And they have these really cute creatures called quokkas. And just do a search on them. So we've talked about that. But to be honest, right now, I'm happy with what I've got, being able to go to the Singapore Zoo, having a picnic at Botanic Gardens, where it's much less crowded now. And as Singapore opens, spending a lot more time at home and with my son. So, Suwao, where are you going to go? Yeah. It's very easy to please me. I'm so eclectic. <laughs> I love cities. I, I love far-flung places. And I would say I veer towards places that feel like the edge of the world and they could be anywhere. It could be the far eastern edge of Russia, like Kamchatka, or the far eastern islands of Indonesia. I was thinking Vietnam after what you said too just now. And it's got this huge, long coast and undiscovered places. And the Vietnamese locals know what they're doing. They're heading to all these places. So I might follow along. So my default, really, when I think of a trip is the other side of the planet. But to be realistic, like you, I'd be happy with a staycation. To me, it seems counterintuitive to book a stay in a country as microscopic as Singapore, but staycations have huge appeal to Singaporeans. I was looking up this Expedia Brands report that showed that Singaporeans averaged 2.4 staycations in 2017. I am half betting that it's going to double this year, <laughs> or even slightly beyond. Thinking about staycations, when I think about it, Singapore has earned this huge global recognition for being a world-class destination, right? It seems to make sense that Singaporeans can also love our local hotel stays and now there are deals that are going to be deals. And you know, after I wrote a story about the peel of staycations in March, at that time hotel stays are still possible. It made me think I should try a staycation too. And it may not be Sentosa like you, but who knows, maybe a city stay and I can be an urban explorer in my own city, picnic on Fort Canning, which I used to love as a kid. But this time I'll have a picnic basket with chilled white wine. Nice. Yeah, I love Fort Canning. I live pretty close and I go there um, a couple times a week. Super, super glad it's open again. I remember the starry skies up above and I think I was five lying on the picnic mat at night and this first glimpse awareness of infinity. So it's great. I don't think it's overpopulated. So while waiting to travel again, we have Fort Canning and Sentosa and Stacations. But what else is there? What else can the group trotter do in Singapore? How do we soothe our wanderlust while staying home in Singapore? So when we first entered this pandemic earlier in the year, we knew it was going to be hard on travellers, not being able to visit places, explore the world. We looked at different ways that we could bring holidays to the home. So some of the things that we did at Skyscanner, for example, is that we developed downloadable play packs to help the little ones learn about the world. We also know that music and travel often go hand in hand. So we shared playlists that were curated based on the theme of the destination. I think everyone knows that with people being locked inside, people have been cooking and eating a lot more. My belly is evidence of that. So we developed a, a shared recipe hub. So we even had a MasterChef Australia winner share her recipe for Greek donuts. The runner-up shared his recipe for chicken curry. 
ultimately all of this doesn't fully replace the two experience of travel but what we and similar travel brands wanted to do was really support our travelers and reinforce that sense of optimism that the world will open up again and it will we will travel again this will pass and they were some of the things that we did at skyscanner siwa just curious how did you satisfy your desire for travel Well, speaking of stay home experiences, I went on two virtual tours recently. There were one hour online escapades. One was a flower hunting tour in the garden of the Kyoto Imperial Palace with a guide and a forest dog. Forest dog because he was born in a forest and then was adopted from a shelter. But I'm kind of felt was full of, you know, serendipity the way that real travel is. because suddenly i'll see the dog chomp dandelions because the flowers apparently quell stomach aches you know according to traditional chinese medicine and they also taste sweet i'm told like chrysanthemum and it was so simple a friend a group trotter she just what's that me 10 minutes before the tour started because someone put out last minute and the whole thing was set there was no plane ticket required not much planning either The other tour was an online class experience where a full-time Moscow guy. So obviously she has no more tours, but she savagely set up a Russian pancake cooking class in her dasha, a countryside summer house. And they were they were short enough, with just one hour to prevent any Zoom fatigue. I felt there was a limit to being immersive, but I still somehow felt transported. to somewhere else and i had written about these virtual tours last week so they're still online if anyone wants to read you can find links to my stories in the text description below so also hotels have put up bite-sized digital content on the good life they are usually hosted on instagram and facebook six senses in singapore for example they streamed workshops on making scented hand sanitizers and how to plant microgreens And I personally like this one, the Anantara, the in Chiang Rai, the hotel was live streaming rescued elephants enjoying bath time in a river. So collectively, the hotels across the world they have created this rich digital world for homebound travel lovers like us with home spa therapies, pastry master classes, cocktails, meditation concerts, poetry. playlists, virtual game drives, and lots more, all of which you can catch online. And at home, I have also been cocooned with my e-books, finally reading and reading quite voraciously again, especially during the circuit breaker. I guess the moment I stepped out of home, it became less. But we have many book lovers among our listeners, so I'm sure the book-loving habit has been reignited, and certainly for me. So it has also been a time of connecting with friends here and everywhere in the world and thinking, contemplating. But this time, instead of like a journey, journey to somewhere else, it's been inner journeys. And I kept thinking, I want to make the best of this pandemic, not squander it, do all these things. Wow, that sounds like you've been super busy. I am definitely going to check out those stories that you wrote as well. I think yeah in general you've got to make the most of these challenging times and the opportunity that we've got right now. For the next part of our podcast, we're going to tackle burning questions sent in by our readers after they responded to our ads in the Straits Times and at the National Library. From our reader, Ms. Bernadette Tan. She says, "My boyfriend plans to return to London and Paris for his 40th birthday, which is in October 2020. I think he's being optimistic. He thinks it can happen." What do you see? Paul, what's your perspective? So, yeah, Bernadette, I think right now there are no definitive answers. The situation is very fluid. Ultimately, whether you travel, it's a very personal decision and you need to consider various factors with health and safety obviously the most important. There are other practical considerations that you might want to look at such as, you know, what do you want to go do on the trip? Are the restaurants, are the theaters, are the attractions that you want to see open, for example? I think it's critically important that you continue to look out for official government information and guidelines before you make the decision both at the destinations that you're going to but also upon returning home. So will I need to self quarantine in the UK and potentially upon returning to Singapore for example? 
it's likely that London and Paris may have different rules as well. So again, critically important that you look at official government information. And then I'd say October is pretty soon. So another thing you, you probably want to consider is as you're planning and booking the trips around flexibility. What are the cancellation or change fees in case you need to adjust your travel plans? We surface a lot of that in our search results at Skyscanner, for example. So hopefully that gives you some guidance, Bernadette. We have a related question from our reader, Mr. Richard Yeo. He wants to know, when can Singaporeans visit the UK? Will there be a 14-day quarantine, Paul? So yes, currently there is a quarantine in place for Singapore travellers who visit the UK, both when you arrive, but you'll likely need to serve a quarantine upon returning as well. Again, I want to emphasise it's really important to look for official government information as you make the decisions and just before you travel, because the situation can change. Yes, yeah, so to our two readers, Ms. Bernadette Tan and Mr. Richard Yeo, who are wondering when to travel again, it's worth noting that this pandemic has a really jagged, unpredictable trajectory. It's ongoing. And just take Australia and South Korea and Japan. All these are favourite destinations for Singaporeans, for Singapore residents, and all these three places are experiencing new ways of infections now, despite having top-rate health systems and despite their robust strategies to fight the virus. So both Paul and I are travel optimists, as you can hear from our conversation, but the reality is that there's no vaccine yet and quarantines are going to be quite possibly enacted. Travel will re-emerge, but in fits and starts. And let's move on to our final question from Mr. Ben Kong. He would like to know, will airfares and hotel rates go up post-COVID? I'll take this first. In the case of hotels, most hotels would rather not lower their price, their rate to attract business because once a price is lowered, it brings down the positioning of the hotel. Instead, the hotels will try to throw in freebies and value add-ons like a champagne or a spa treat or a sweetener like 30% of the restaurant bill, for example. I've even seen 6pm checkouts, which is pretty generous. So overall, when we look at hotels, we can look at the total package. And even if the room rates do not change too much, if the total package is of value, it can still be attractive. Paul? Yeah, we talked a bit about pricing before, and it's really hard to know exactly how the industry is going to react. In the meantime, I'd say people should be looking out for great opportunities. We've seen some great deals from hotels that are offering packages that you can actually book and pay for now, but you actually use that travel within the next 12 months. And I think we'll see a lot of great prices over the coming months. So definitely keep your eyes out. Go to Skyscanner, sign up for our newsletter and our price alerts and, and keep an eye out for those deals so that when we can travel again, you can find some great deals. Paul, thank you for your ideas and insights. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. And to all our listeners, thanks for these questions. Have a great day and let's keep the spirit of travel alive. Well, that's a wrap, and we'd like to thank our readers for sending in their questions. The Ask ST at NLB podcast series was brought to you by the National Library Board. In this COVID-19 pandemic, you can download the NLB mobile app to access your personal library anywhere, anytime. Follow the Straits Times podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcast apps, and rate us. That was an SBH podcast by The Straits Times. Find us on Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts or streaming on Google Home. Do feedback to us at podcast.sbh.com.sg. You can also check out more podcasts on various topics at The Straits Times and The Business Times online.